Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation, brought to you by Jegs, the leader in high-performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to jegs.com to fix your hot rod up or your everyday vehicle. Well, as I always say, deep breath, everybody. You're looking at her. How you doing, Danica? <laughs> Makes me worried about what you're about to ask me. Deep breath. What? <laughs> we're we're going to have a good time. So oh, I know we will. We always do. Let's start out like this. Uh, I thought to myself, how am I going to introduce Danica? But but listen, it's pretty easy. There, there's a lot to you, and I know that, and we're going to get to it. But let's start like this. Danica Patrick, the most successful lady racer in American open wheel racing. But I say the world. I think you're the most successful lady world open wheel racer. Uh, I don't think there's anybody like you in the world with open wheel. Welcome to Kenny Conversation. <laughs> I like it. That's a very flattering opening. Thank you. You've done a lot. <laughs> so um, it was your birthday last week. Happy birthday. Thanks. Thank you. God, it's like I turned 42 and 42 sounds a lot like 42, but 41 still somehow sounds like 40, which could be 39, but 42 is 42. I follow you on Instagram. I follow uh, what's up. It's a lot of fun. You're busy, but uh you look really zen right now. You're not, you're not as, are you still feisty? Oh, like a hundred percent. Like that's, <laughs> that lives right below the surface. It's just not all of my being now. It, it's not everybody, uh, you know, taunting you. Well, listen, yeah. your dad, TJ, uh, for some reason we're friends. I don't know why, uh, but I like him. And he says that Danica is a lot of fun. And for a father to say that, he said you're a jokester, but I don't, I think he meant fun. So that's the first question of Kenny conversation. I like that. Are you fun? Am I fun? Well, I can't answer that because, well, I can say that I laugh at my own jokes. So I am fun for myself. Um, I'm also like great alone. Like I'm a good introvert. So, you know, that means that feels like it tells me I'm fun because I, I can entertain myself. Um, but I, but I think it's a little like asking, are you famous? It's kind of in the mm -hmm. eye of the beholder. Like if you have to ask if I'm famous, I'm probably not. If you have to ask, if you have to ask me if I'm fun, I'm not sure I am. So Kenny conversation is just what it is. Uh, we don't have a, a, a line. It can go everywhere. And I want to remind you of something that you taught me, uh, Sometimes people say to me, hey, remember when you said this? So I'm going to do that to you. Uh, you said that it's good to have two or three of you and, uh, you know, a subconscious. Mm. Uh, so you helped me along the way because when people tell me I'm goofy, I'm like, well, there's two or three of me. So I don't it depends which one I want to give you today. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you for that. You're really into exploring yeah, for sure. I do love, uh, I like learning about the occult, which is just the hidden, you know, like what's mm. really going on, um, including with ourselves. Uh, I feel like in general, life is just like a big cat and mouse game with ourselves, where we can't see ourselves. So everyone around us shows us who we are, whether it's how we're triggered, how we react to things, what we like what we value or what we judge in someone, it's all really just information about ourselves. because when we change the things we see change. I mean, the perfect example of that is like, it's silly, but old music, or for me, it's old rap music. Mm -hmm. You know, I listen to it now and I go, whoa, that's what they say. No wonder why mom and dad didn't want us to listen to it. Or, oh, the lyrics sound so obvious, right? They're more clear or I'm listening to them. So you know, that's just one silly example, but yeah. Yeah. I think that we have different aspects of ourselves that come out at different times. And, um, and I probably, what you're referring to as far as different personalities or different, different sides, um, is that 
you know, I, I've always been really fortunate that I feel like I've gotten to express a lot of those sides within my career, whether it's through on track activity or interviews or photo shoots or any of those kinds of things. I feel like people got to see different aspects of me. And, um, and I, and I was always grateful that that was welcome. I like that because I agree with it because I don't want people to think there's, this is me. Like, like I get aggressive when people go, Oh, you're, you're this way or that way. I'm like, hold on. There's a lot more to me than you think there is, you know? Mm -hmm. So back up. Uh, yeah. Like what? Like, give me an example. Like, give me one thing. I'm not crazy. <laughs> I'm not crazy. You're not uh, crazy. I, I pay. Well, maybe I am. Maybe I am crazy, but I also think that, uh, look at you now. This is what? turning into pretty intense. Now you're interviewing me. I uh, like, I, but I thought that it was I a like, perfect opportunity because at the end of the day, somebody might tune in because I'm on it, but people are tuning in every week because it's you. So yeah. everyone mm -hmm. will want to know a little bit more about you too. Yeah, well, I, that, I'll take that, but that's humbling. Okay, so we're going to get to racing in just a little bit, but I did not want to start out by attacking you about racing. Uh, I want to comment on what you just said. Do you remember that that movie, The Truman Show, where you're oh, yeah. watching the movie and at the very end? You mean the you mean the documentary about what we're really living in? Yes. We're at the very end. Uh, Jim Carrey, his little boat just runs into a wall and actually the whole world is watching. And you're like, oh, my God, that is us. That's that's pretty deep. You but think that do you think there's any there? I mean, there's a lot of I mean, we're we're slipping into a total different like space here. But there's, of course, like the idea that it's a flat earth, that it's a dome like that would be one of the references. <laughs> so another one is that we are like an in a simulation and, you know, there's like puppeteers mm. moving, dealing, do, moving the people around uh, like a game. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, think, there's some possibility. I think it's important to think like that because I also think that's why there's religion. One time I asked, uh, father John, he married, uh, my, my wife, Kim and myself. And, uh, I said, uh, how do I know I should believe in God. And he said, well, it's all what you believe in. What's your faith. And I thought, wow. So he, you know, father John said, it's what you believe in there. There's Baptist, there's Catholic, there's Pentecostal. Okay. Wow. We're going deep. <laughs> I mean that. Yeah. I like it. You know, the, you know me, I get in the, I love these, these uh, conversations, but there's my belief is that perception is reality. So mm. um, if we, and which all you have to do is think about what, you, you know, what your thoughts rule your reality. You know, if you think negative, you have a bad day. If you think positive, you have a good day. If you're excited about something, it's going to go great. If you're optimistic, if you're, if you have a direction that you want to go, a goal, like your thoughts become things and your perception is your reality. So, you know, if you believe that there's a God and that is your, is that, and that's your perception, then the result is the same. It's almost like a little bit of like a placebo. We write placebo off for being something that doesn't really work, but it does work. Like that's the it's kind of the definition is like something works without actually having an active ingredient. It's happening um, psychologically. And, um, and so, yeah, it's. Yeah. But that, that's yeah. so true because uh, mind over matter. If you think you're a winner, you are, but I, I do like that comment. You all, I, I've read that. You've said that a lot where, you, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the food thing, you know, you are what you eat. If you eat junk, you're going to get fat, you know, yeah. eat good. You're going to be, you're going to be healthy. All right. Let's move on. Um, like I said, I follow you on Instagram. Uh, Instagram is a really good site. It seems like it's quality. And I, and I like what you show your sister you and your sister brooke uh i think that's rare you love her oh yeah we get along great we're very close well, why do you think i mean i, I think it's awesome i yeah. wish rust I, I love my brothers but but boy when you're with your sister i mean you really brag on her i yeah you guys are just tell me about you and your sister oh thanks um i mean we're close in age i think that matters a little bit we're only two years apart hmm. um 
I mean, we just spent so much time together. Like when we were, she was the one who wanted to race go-karts. Not oh, really. Me. No, I just said I would do it too. Um, so then she was eight and I was 10. And then it just led to us traveling around the country for the next seven years in a truck or a van spending umpteen hours together. And so, you know, we spent a lot of time together and, um, and we have a lot of the same interests. I think that, I think we've also, I think what really shifted into making us really close, good sisters was, um, when she got her first job in Indianapolis at the hospital, she got her doctorate in physical therapy. So mm -hmm. she started working and, um, she started having her own money and her own confidence and her own thing. And when that happened, it was just like a switch flipped. And she went from being possibly sometimes a little bit negative or, you know, not happy to just, and she would probably say the same thing if she was sitting here with me and I was commenting on it, she'd, she'd agree um, that, that that was just a really big shift. She had her own thing, you know? And I think that I had my own thing for a long time already. Um, and she, she, she developed her own thing. And I think that when we build our own confidence within ourselves, we are able to, when we, when we, when we see ourselves in a really positive way, we can then see the best in other people easier. And, um, and so I, it just really, it just really made her into a, a wonderful woman and, um, we've always gotten along, but I'd say that's when it became like, uh, a true friendship where it wasn't like bickery sisters. Um, we'll still have our moment. She's actually doing a very good job. I've always been like this very, very, very honest, like straightforward, can't hold it back. Thoughts. Oh yeah. Was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, you. It's got a lot of downsides, but it's got some upsides, I guess. Um, and, you know, she's also, she's learning how to do that. So she's learning to find her voice and be honest about stuff when it bothers her. And so every now and again, we'll have these moments where she'll be like, Danica, this really made me mad when you did this and it hurt my feelings. And, you know, and, and so I'm like, okay. And the thing is, is that I've always delivered that kind of thing. I've always been able to, I always say the thing. Um, but the truth is, is I can handle the thing too. That's, that's what's hard for people to understand is it's a, it, it, not that the people that are uh, um, harshly honest or, or 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 say things that are hurtful or offensive or just super honest or cutting deep, it's not like there. It's not like I or we. I guess I'm collectively using we. I don't think that it's that we are just mean. I think it's that that's literally where we how we like to to deal with life is just say it, be honest. And so once she started to generate her own voice too along the way, it's really made it a lot easier to keep the energy between us super clean too. Two things. I find that when people are dead honest with each other, they're a little mad at like the first time it happens, mm -hmm. but then they become mm -hmm. really tight because now we know yep. where each other stands and now we get along and it's like, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. And one other thing about that, is that when you were talking so nice of your sister right there, I like to have people around that add to my positive energy. I don't want people around that I have to fix all the time because I'm happy. And you said you're happy. So Danica's happy. Kenny's happy. Now let's surround ourselves with people that are happy too. It gets yeah. exhausting fixing neg negative people and picking them up. And yeah, it does. It does. And, and the thing is, is you can, until you're some enlightened Buddha where you have no, judgment, <laughs> no nothing, which, you know, uh, I'm not one of them. Um, you know, you can definitely lift people up and there's, you know, I'm sure that, you know, when I see you, you automatically like lift my energy and lift my spirits up. That's right. Um, love seeing you love talking to you right now, but in person's even better. Um, but, uh, there are people that do that, but at some point in time, enough always is enough and people can, people can get to you. And, um, there's only so much, so much in the, so much in the bucket. Right. Okay. So one more conversation before we go into uh, your racing career. So uh, I remember Danica when she was the race car driver and she was feisty. As my mama would say, dynamite comes in small packages and, and you, you, you're, I, I find it, you're like my mama. She's going to tell you what she thinks. Uh, but that's really not the conversation here. All of a sudden, when you left racing, I felt like, just following you, uh, you became into you. 
you got into mind and body wellness. You started, I, I kind of got a nickname. I was doing my studying on you. I got oh all these God. notes. And, and I, and I kind of, after I was doing it, it's kind of like Danica, the Explorer. Yeah. When, when, when did this mind and body, what made you go? I think it's great. What made you go that route? Uh, I thought, I, you know, it's funny because anytime I talk to somebody like in an interview or after racing, um, they go, wow, you've really gotten into this. Like, you're really deep. Is this new? And the truth I is, I like it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's not. But where was this time and space and need for it in a quick three to seven minute interview here and there along the way when we're referring to something that just kind of happened on track, you know, there's not like, you know, there really wasn't a lot of space for it. Now it has had time to develop in, into a bigger thing for me and more awareness and more, just more knowledge and more embodiment of the things that I've always, was always curious about. Uh, but, but it's always been there. Like I, I refer to the story of calling a psychic when I was 18 for my birthday. Cause I wanted to, <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> I've just always been into that kind of stuff. I, yeah. I've been into the, into the, the universe and spirituality. Um, religion's always been something interesting for me. I'm like a general skeptic. So, um, and maybe, I don't know if skeptic's the full right word. It's more that I'm super curious. So I think sometimes my in inquisition to somebody can feel like that, like a Spanish inquisition, when really it's just my form of empathy of understand. Like I just, I just very much want to understand all the way, like down to the depths of your soul, what's going on and, or the depths of the universe, what's mm. going on, um, uh, or the depth of this reality and what's going on. Is this a simulation? Is it not? You know, these are, these are questions that, as my dad would say, you're never going to get an answer. And I'm like, yeah, but we're, you definitely are never going to get an answer unless you try. And so I think that, you know, as I learn more and more, it, uh, I feel like I get more and more information from it about what's going on through different pathways. I, I, hey, listen, I'm right there with you. I'll sit there and I'll go, okay, what's beyond, beyond? So they, they say, okay, there's outer space. Yeah, but hold on. What's, what's beyond outer? What's Because it never I mean, ends. So yeah, Okay, let, let's say we're a, let's say this is us, but what's out there? I know, right? There's yeah. got to be something at the end. What's the, the end? The end is the what? The end is yeah. the going. <laughs> your dad's right, though. Uh, so it's true. Are yeah. you like your Are you like your dad, or are you like your mama? Um, I'd say I'm much more like my dad. Yeah, yeah. my dad's deep too. My dad's a thinker. My dad's yeah. definitely a thinker. Um, he, uh, you know, I get my creativity from him. I think my ambition. Um, my, but, but generally like my dreaming, I think is the biggest and best thing that came from him. His like throughout our whole lives, he's just like always in, always come up with new ideas for a company or, a, yeah. you know, a way to make the go-kart faster. Just like, he's so creative. Um, I mean, for a long time, my sister and I, and my mom would get, my dad would go pick out an outfit for us for Christmas. Like we'd have matching outfits every year and dad always did such a good job. And then one year it was over because it was like vests and a hat. And I was like, no, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it. it's it. You, you've reached the end of your, of your, of your, of your, yeah. you know, term it's done. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's some stuff I really get from my dad. I do get some stuff from my mom too, but, um, but, but I'm mostly like my dad. Yeah. I like, well, it's, hey, that's a good thing. Uh, my mom, uh, when I grew up as a child, my mom had this little statue sitting on our coffee table and it was the thinker and it was a statue and, and it was like, a, like a mm -hmm. Roman guy and he sat here like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I understand there's a little bit more to, you know, when you say the thinker, it, it's just thinking logically, you know, and trying to make good yeah. decisions. All right, it's showtime now. Um, I just dreamed that up. <laughs> I am going to introduce you. Uh, and when I'm done, we'll talk about it. Okay, so what I did is, and now listen, I, I do this with all the greats. I did it with Tony Stewart, did it with Harvick. You know, uh, mm -hmm. these are 200, by the way. I'm 60 years old. <laughs> okay, here we go.
started racing at age 10, winning three World Karting Association Grand National Championships in the mid-90s. Now, you feel free to butt in if I get anything wrong. Uh, I want to come back and talk about this next one. You went to the United Kingdom uh, to race. And then I have a question. What was that like? We're going to come back to that. I'm introducing you right now. Uh, you won the 2008 Indy Japan 300. The only win ever by a lady in Indy Car Series history. First lady to win pole position in a NASCAR Cup Series race. And by the way, it was the, the biggest race of all the Daytona 500. This one's pretty cool. NASCAR most starts, laps led, and top tens by a lady. This one's also incredible. Highest finishing lady in the Indy 500, third, and what a race. You were racing for the win. Uh, and the Daytona 500 finishing eighth. One of only 14 racers, man or lady, for, forget you're a lady. One of only 14 racers in history, man or lady, to lead laps in the Indy 500 and the Daytona 500. Now, we can go on and on and on, but I think those are the, those are the granddaddy of them all. When I say all that, do, do you remember that life? And, and tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. I think the first thing that happens when a bio of sorts or <laughs> accomplishments has been read is that my first thoughts are, I wish I'd have done more. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's a common answer or not, but that's definitely um, something that crosses my mind. But then, um, but I like the way you finished. That's probably one of my favorite stats is having led Indy and Daytona and to be one of so few that have done that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I had a really fun career. I'm so glad that I got to do IndyCar and NASCAR. And um, and I was saying to someone not long ago that it's just kind of funny to be someone that's done something that no one else in the world's ever done before. It's just kind of, it's just kind of funny. It's just kind of weird. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's really cool. It's a big deal. And listen, we're, we're going to get to more of that. I, I want to break some of your accomplishments down individually. Let's go back to uh, when you first started racing. I don't know why that caught my eye. Uh, you, where are you from? Are you from Illinois? You're from Beloit, yeah. Wisconsin or Illinois? I was born in Beloit, Wisconsin, because it was the closest hospital, but from grew up in Illinois. That's what I thought. Okay. So you left Illinois, the middle of America, and you went to the United Kingdom or UK. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What what was that about? That that had to be an incredible experience at, at such a young age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was to race. I'm. It was so basically at fourteen. Um, we were contacted by, or we were contact. I fourteen years old, Indy five hundred. I went to this turn two suite of this family. It was called, the, they were the Meekum family. Um, they used to have an Indy car back in the day and a family from Texas. And there was some British guy up there and I was asking questions about racing. And all I remember he said was that I could learn more there in one year than five years in the States. Mm. And I was like, wow, that seems like a good deal. <laughs> and yeah. so that was when I was 14. And then two years later when I was 16, this family had been following my career and they said, we'd like to talk to you about, you know, racing, um, maybe in England or moving forward or representing you. And um, so my dad and I drove down to Indy. It was during the month of May and uh, we met with them and ended up driving home. And uh, what they wanted to do was take me to England to see if I was good and see if I could do it and see if I could develop into a, you know, professional driver someday. And so I went over and tested a car and I guess it was good enough that I went back and did what, what would be called a winter series. Uh, so, um, that's when I left, that was junior year of high school then. And so I was there like the first and last month of the first semester. So I was gone for the middle two months and, uh, that was the last school I did. 
Um, I pretty much only like went through sophomore year, really. Yeah. Uh, junior year, I was only there for half of the first half of the year. Mm. So, uh, and then I, I, they offered me this opportunity to go to England and race. And my parents just said, I, I mean, it's a hard decision, but it would be even harder to not have the opportunity. And so I uh, pulled out of school halfway through my junior year and moved to England and ended up living there for three years. Wow. So, you know, I, I, I always, ED. what's that? Got my GED, my good enough that's diploma. That's badass. <laughs> okay, I've never heard that. I gotta write that down. Good enough. So yeah, but that's good enough. But I always say uh they said they said Dale Earnhardt Sr. like oh was gone in the 10th grade or eighth grade. And I, yeah. I'm like, look, hold on, listen. One of the for men, my wife says this. She says sometimes men don't know what they want to do till they're 32 years old. So my response to her, I said, but listen, when you, we go to school so we can do what we need to do because we're, we're supposedly getting knowledge to do what we want to do. But if you know what you want to do, by all means, uh, you know, go do it. Yeah. And, and, I went here, to my own college over there. Yes. Because that's what you did. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, I guess what I'm saying is I don't buy into that. You must go to school. And, you know, you had an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a super firm believer in the institution itself anyway. Yeah. I mean, especially well, college. I mean, what a financial drain for so many. Um, but high school and grade school, even just when you look at the curriculum and look at what they learn, it's like, how much how much of that stuff do you use, Kenny? Yeah. How no. much of that stuff do I use? Like. Like none. I mean, the best thing that it's for is like, you need to know, yes, reading, writing, ma basic math, right? Like how often do you use algebra? Yeah, never. Oh, right. Okay. So if you need to, if you need, if you want to go be an architect, you'll learn that in your specialized degree. Go to a school for that. Exactly. Exactly. But you don't need to know it for your regular life. And so I think there's so much about the curriculum that's off anyway. And then when you fast forward to college and how much debt is created within the schools and it's just like it's just it's crazy yeah so what you're saying is the uk is where, where you graduated uh, yeah kind yeah. of in life even uh well, one more thing about that uh were you there by yourself yeah was it wild being by yourself could you do what you wanted to do i mean it was exciting at first like think about being 16 years old you're an ocean away from your parents you're <laughs> You no, know, I couldn't drive yet though. You had to be 17 to drive. Mm. So I still had to get driven around a bit. Um, but, uh, but it was, uh, it was, it was very cool. I, the first year I lived with two girls and when I first got there, I was sleeping on the couch and then there was two rooms and three of us. And so yeah. one of the girls that was there full time had a whole room and then the other girl that left on the weekends was um, in a tiny room. And when I mean tiny room, I mean a shoebox of a friggin' room. Like it yeah. was so small. And that's the room I ended up getting because she just she since she was only there during the week, she's like pulled did the pull out bed during oh. the week. Um, and then the next year I lived with a family, um, mm. which was no fun. And then the last year I lived by myself. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I've always been intrigued about that because I, I had heard, you know, mm -hmm. 15, 15 years ago that Danica went there by, you know, by herself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's, let's break some of these massive accomplishments down. Uh, I want to go back to that IndyCar win at, uh, that was Motigi. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been there uh, yeah. when, when NASCAR went there. What a, what a different racetrack, really uphill into turn one, downhill, down the back straightaway. I'm sure you could run that in your sleep right now. You win. We mostly race on the oval. The only time we raced on the road course was at the end, the last yeah. year, because we had to get, um, we had to go on the road course because that was just after that huge um, tsunami, like got mm. like hit the nuclear plant, and that like when it like there was like a nuclear. Was it a? I thought it was a tsunami, or maybe it was a nuclear yeah. explosion. I can't, I thought it was a tsunami for some reason. Um, maybe, maybe it was just a nuclear explosion, but anyway, um, so, but there was, uh, yeah, it must've been the tsunami cause there was something of an earthquake, but there was so many tremors going on that we had them throughout the entire stay. So, and it ended up moving the race from the oval to the road course. 
the last I'll be darn. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's why we're that's why we're having a conversation. I'll be darn. So you, this is in a historical moment. Uh, I've seen the pictures. Uh, you know, it's it's big to win a race, but now you're you're like the Statue of Liberty. You're a lady. You do the first. Nobody's ever done it. Um, take me through that. You know, you don't got to go detail, but that whole global. You win. You're in victory lane. You get back to America. Tell me all about that. That win. Well, I always loved going to Japan. I did. It was like the time change put me right into my favorite time of day, which is morning. Everybody was up so early. And I remember every morning I'd just go run around the track because they leveled off the top of the mountain for the people who don't know. Mm -hmm. And they built a racetrack there. So there's the oval and the road course. So I would just go out and run all the way around all of it and come back. And so, you know, when you're up at four or 5 a.m. and you don't have anything to do till like nine, you know, you got time. <laughs> Um, so I just, and it was every year until the last year we were there during April, which was cherry blossom season. And it was just like the most beautiful time. And it was so pretty to, they had cherry blossoms all the way around the track. And so, so first off, I just always liked going there. It was just like, it felt really good. And, um, and then the year that I won, there was rain. Um, so it was delayed a day. And mm. so we raced kind of mid morning the next day. And, I remember that night in the hotel room, there was track feed to your hotel room TV, um, which is pretty much more interesting than anything other than um, sumo wrestling, because I didn't understand a word anything I, anybody else was saying. But the sumo, you know, you can understand that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so watching the track feed and you watch. The you are fun. <laughs> oh, you're watching these ladies, these 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 lovely ladies with towels and buckets sopping up the weepers on the track and like wringing them into buckets. Yeah, I know. Oh my gosh. I didn't know like, that's where that was going to go. That's it's incredible. like sweeping water at the shore back into the ocean, man. It's just really, really, really pointless. But, um, but there were some weepers was part of the problem why it took so long to dry the track. So that's why we raced the next day. And, um, and it was, you know, it was one of those races where I, Brian Herta had told me, maybe a year or two before he's like, one of these days, you're just going to be doing the same thing that you normally do. And you're going to win. Mm. I'm like, hmm. And so sure enough that day, I was just doing the same thing that I normally do. And, um, and there was, uh, there was a caution and there must've been somewhere around 50 to go ish. And me and, um, Elio and a few others ended up pitting to play the, play the fuel game, fuel strategy game. And so, I just started early. Like Kyle Moyer was my, was my, um, my engineer and, or my, um, my crew chief or no, huh, I get them all mixed up now because of an IndyCar and NASCAR strategist. strategist. He's my strategist. And, um, Kyle's kind of a legend and he just, you know, was giving me a number, a target from pretty early on. And I was just pretty diligent and I'm pretty good at that. And, uh, and so when it came to the end of the race, there was still some laps left, but when I saw Elio, I got by him as quick as I could because I thought if a yellow comes out and there's only a couple of laps left, like, I don't want to be of safe, you know, I, I didn't, I don't want to have waited till the last lap just to be safe. Like I want to pass him to be safe. So I passed him and I, and I, I think I, I'm sure I, I pulled away. I think I won by like five seconds or something like that. So I had done a really good job of saving fuel and, um, and, uh, and it all worked out. And I just remember feeling really relieved mostly like I was excited, but I was mostly relieved because I felt like, I mean, shoot, I almost won my first year actually. That, so that would have been 2008. My first year was 2005. And in 2005 at Motegi, I qualified on the front row. Mm. I finished fourth. And then I almost won the Indy 500 the next race. So I was pretty sure that that was race number three and four. I think that that was the way it went. Um, so like I almost won in my fourth Indy car race. So it felt so overdue for so long that it took so many years to, to finally get there. And I'm sad that it didn't happen more often, but, um, but, uh, but grateful for it. You know, that is a, uh, that's a Kenny conversation too with Danica, you know, about looking back, uh, I never won a cup race, you know, run second three times. That, that's another story. And we can dive deeper into that. 
another year. So you brought it up. When I watched the Indy 500 and you were leading, battling for the win, you're legit. Forget being a lady because everybody wants to remind you, you know, you're a lady. Uh, but that wasn't a, a great Indy 500. Take me through that as you're battling to win the Indy 500, dicing back and forth. Tell me about that race. Yeah. Um, my first one. Um, so, I mean, man, I remember, I mean, rookie orientation, I was the fastest, like, you know, I think I was fastest, I was fastest many days, enough days that I got the big check at the end of the day. And I had to go to the media center and we were like, we had like words of the day that I had to get in during my interviews and we had a good time. And I think I was fastest on carb day, maybe, um, almost got the pole, but I almost spun in turn one. So my effort was still enough to put me forth to start the race. Uh, but I started the race off and I stalled in the pits. And so that I was running I top five somewhere ish and I stalled. So that put me to the back and I was so inexperienced that, and it was back in the day when we had sequential gearboxes. So mm -hmm. I wasn't sure where I was at exactly. And I didn't want to have them start it and accidentally not be fully in neutral. So I had the clutch in, but you can't start the car with the clutch in. Mm. And I didn't even know that then. So I was like, oh my God. So I was uh, all the way to the back, made my way through. And I feel like I was somewhere around eighth ish and coming for a restart and just like looped it, just got on the gas and just whoom. And as I spun around, I don't know if I, I don't know if there was some checking up. I mean, I'd have to literally watch it to see like what the, what the, what the train was doing, but, um, but I spun either way and someone came across, cleared my front nose off, but it like spun me straight to head to the pit lane. So I like got on pit road, pit in and pulled into the pits, changed my nose, um, Pit wall was close, so it was a penalty. So then topped off on the way back through because I had to do another drive through. And that was what put me in the position to go to the end of the race. Um, but that, you know, that meant that I was stretching tires, stretching fuel. And so I was, I inherited the lead through a caution because everyone came in to get tires and fuel later in the race. And then I led for a while. It was very easy. It felt very comfortable. It was so quiet, man. The lead is so quiet. Um, and then I was saving. I think I, I think I don't remember if I got past then I got passed on track, obviously. And then there was another caution that came out. And the, on the restart, I remember I came up on the came on the radio and I was like, man, everyone say a prayer here. And they're like, we've been doing it all day. So the restart, <laughs> restart came. And I got a great run and I passed Dan Weldon for the back for the lead. And my favorite clip uh, ever is this like thir 30 second clip from a fan in turns one and two. And it's just like a, it's just a fan video. And it's, you know, you can hear the cars start coming towards turns one and two. And it sounds like, you know, rocket ships coming, coming at them. And all the fans start going, she did it, she did it, she did it. And like, everyone's going crazy. And they're like erupting like crazy, like cheering so loud to the point where after the race, people asked me if I heard the fans. Like, did mm. you hear the fans? That's how loud they were. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, took the lead back. And back then we had eight fuel slots. So eight was for uh, caution. So it would cut cylinders and save a lot of fuel but then you had seven fuel saving positions. And so I started off in one and, um, you know, quickly two, three, four, and just kept going down. I kept, it was like pulling away, kind of holding steady. I don't think it was until I got to like fuel slot five, maybe, or six that I actually started, like Dan started catching me. Um, and I just wasn't able to hold a low enough line with like my tires were 50 laps old and I just, I just could not hold it low enough. So he could get his wing just underneath me enough to get, get air. And, um, and then he got by and, um, and then they were like, just save fuel, save fuel. So it felt like emergency mode of saving fuel to make it to the end. So once I lost the lead, then it was just really a matter of doing, saving as much as possible. And so I ended up fourth. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, there was maybe a little more fuel left in that tank than they thought, but you know, it's uh 
but that was, that was how it went. Wow. And, and you know, that was a little bit ago and, and people's brains are more powerful than we think because you just took me through. I caught what, what I, as a race car driver, you, you said, you, you, you know, early, like the day before, whatever you got loose somewhere. What is it? And this is a, this is a question I want to know, cause I've never drove an Indy car. When you get loose in one of those, like, you know, our stock cars, we do this. What is it like getting loose in an Indy car? I mean, it's just, you just, you just have such less time to save it. It's like the death wiggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not, it's not, even though let's say in qualifying when I about spun out in turns one in turn one, um, I probably got more respect for saving it than if I would have just qualified on the pole. Mm, yeah, I get it. I understand. Okay. Wow. Those now is your, I'm looking at you right now. Uh, are you deep in the thought about those times right now? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 can, I, I can, I'm I looking just, at you right yeah. now. You're living that in your brain right now. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, you, you, you did a lot, you know, you did a lot. And, and I know pretty much what you're thinking. So when I won my first Xfinity race, it was like, oh, we did it. Now I got to do it again. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for some reason we're just never good enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And you got to do it again. Got to do it again. But mm -hmm. Danica. Uh, you did it. I mean, you are one badass lady. So let's clear our mind. Um, because I was right there with you. <laughs> I gotta like, clear take, me back. take me back and keep me in fuel slot four. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that should be a movie, you know. Fuel slot four. Mm -hmm. It started childhood, get to the end of the movie, and you're leading the Indy 500. Oh, oh, by the way, this is this is real. Um, uh, okay. Let's move forward a little bit. And, and now we're in the part of the Kenny conversation where we're 45 minutes into this deal. And I, I want to highlight these things in your life. Uh, I, as I said, we, we can't go hours. Uh, so you, you start this NASCAR adventure. Uh, you know, you, you come to NASCAR. So the first thing is... is you had success in IndyCar. Why did you make the decision to come NASCAR? I was just kind of, I was kind of sick of uh, the direction that IndyCar was going. It was going more and more road course racing. And I mm. really enjoyed the ovals. Um, when I started, it was three road courses and it kind of went to five and then seven or eight and ended up being pretty close to half the schedule. So I just, you know, I just didn't enjoy that as much. And, and also I didn't enjoy the situation that I was in with my team. Um, I, uh, I think the, the first time, the only time I've ever talked about this was on the Jocko podcast. Um, and it was, I was in a, my contract with Andretti was a profit sharing contract or was a, was a basically over a certain amount of money. We split how much more, how, what was on the car. Um, and so, yeah, a profit sharing situation. And they just never really produced um, like viable documentation and um, or paid me what I should. And so I sued them and ended up going through mediation all the way to arbitration. And yeah, I just was not like happy in that situation anymore. I just didn't like the team anymore. Didn't didn't enjoy like the direction of the races. Uh, so I was just ready for a change. And I felt like NASCAR really, and I remember going to the, I remember going to Phoenix and just kind of like messing around and hopping in a, hopping in a stock car, like climbing in a window while I was still a <laughs> car driver yeah. and everybody was like real excited about it. And I was like, Oh, maybe they'd like me here. And, oh. uh, and I remember the first test that I did. So the, the way I started was slow. I didn't just jump into NASCAR. I did part-time NASCAR, part-time IndyCar. Or no, part-time NASCAR, full-time IndyCar still for two years. And so in 2010 and 11, I did um, some nationwide racing, what was nationwide then. And I think I did 10 or so races. And, um, and I remember testing for the very first time down in Orlando with uh, – Tony Uri Jr. and Pops and uh, 
I just remember taking off out of pit lane and going, oh my God, this is so fun. I'm home. Like I, I just, I don't know. It just like felt so natural and, um, and just really liked him and really had a lot of fun. And so that's how I started was just nice and easy. I mean, I just finished fifth in the championship in, um, in 2009 and had my best, you know, best championship run, ran in the top five, qualified in the top five, like every weekend, it was my best year. And, so I, I was definitely making a gamble to, to leave, but that's why I didn't just go full on NASCAR. I, I want to, I want to go back 10 seconds ago and then come back. So the, the racer and me signing all my contracts at NASCAR, that profit sharing deal, that, that's interesting. I'm going to say it and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. So the more money you made, the more, the better you did, the more money you made, they wanted part of it. Is that it was right? more about the sponsorship on the car? Okay, got it. So, yeah. um, yeah, you no, know, that was back in those days. I had like Motorola, um, Argent, um, Big ones. Meyer, One America. Um, I had a bunch of them. I mean, I think our primary was like a seven million dollar primary in IndyCar, which is a big primary. So, yes. and I and I made I think it was 40 percent above nine million. So, and I knew Argent was a big one because Argent came from came from Ray Hall. And so when, when Argent and Meyer came from Ray Hall, I didn't get paid at the end of that contract either. Cause they're like, you stole the sponsors. And so I not only didn't get paid, I had to pay, I had to also pay the team some money. So I like heavily paid for those sponsors to be yeah. able to be on the car. And then they still cheated me out of money. <laughs> because first of all, those sponsors were there because of you, but mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even Argent wrote a, wrote a like letter saying the only reason why we went to this team was because of Danica, but they put the sticker on other cars and then they stood up there on the stand and said like, Oh, they were very fascinated with Dario and Ashley Judd. And they wanted to, it's like, they were just so full of shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Yes. That sounds like us right there. Yes. Uh, and you got to call it out sometimes when it's so ridiculous. Like, things in the world today. Sometimes you got to go, look, stop. This is not wrestling. Okay. If I was drunk, I'd believe it more, but I'm not drunk. So I get that. All right. Back, back to NASCAR. You caught that, right? <laughs> I'm not going to play along. Okay. <laughs> uh, back to NASCAR. Now I want to ask a rough question, but I think it's okay because it's what I would say. You, you came from IndyCar which for better term is wine and cheese, uh, you know, and, and, and we love wine and we love cheese, but more sophistication. Uh, people are very clean shaven. Then you come to NASCAR. Um, now you're dealing with this. Hey girl, get on over here. What did you feel any of that? Now this is a fun question, but a little rough around the edges. When you came from IndyCar, and you came to NASCAR. Was NASCAR kind of rednecky, or or was it? Oh yeah, it... of course. Tell like me I about remember that. doing seat fittings um, with Tony Erie <laughs> Jr. and and I was he's like something about you know where do you want to go to lunch? And I was like, oh, I think there's a Panera, and he called it Pandera. He couldn't. Like... <laughs> Panera is like good food, you know. It's there's no Pandera. grease. <laughs> um, and you know you go into the hauler, and GAC would be on. Great American country. Oh, you know, you'd yeah. be watching like shows about hunting in so, the morning because that's what they play before music videos. And, uh, and you know, there'd be hot dogs on a roll wheel outside and, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the and some foods out on the, you know, it was definitely a little bit more casual. And, and it, it, it and that's put that's putting it nicely. That, this reminds me of when I watched Saturday Night Live, and and Jeff Gordon. It's like okay, that was the day. I don't know if you watched it, but that's the day when we knew what the world thought about NASCAR at that time. Had all the rednecks, I, of course. Oh, you know, it was uh, yeah. You know, but I mean, it, it it's it's just country, and like you said, the hot dogs outside the hauler. You know, you grab you one and. Finger food, you got dirt on your finger, you grab the food, you eat it, and then you do it again. And yeah, that's fun. The only time I do that's at Burning Man now. You know, everything's covered in dirt there. Okay, so it, it, it's here. 
it, it, it's at the very bottom, Burning Man. Wow. I think I want to go. That looks like a Kenny Wallace trip. 100%. I think that you would have a blast. I think you would be like, the energy would transfer through you and you just like, you'd add to the vibe too. Yeah, I think I'd run around naked is what I would you do. Very <laughs> you very much If you wanted to. The first day, I'll tell us. I went two times, the last two years and the first year when I went, it was like, the second day I was there and I, it was quite a whiteout. It was very like windy cause it's in the salt flats. So the wind kicks up and it's just a whiteout. So people have goggles. That's a big reason why you have goggles there. And so I put the goggles on, got on my bike. Everybody rides a bike everywhere. Cause it's very spread out. It's a, and there's 80,000 people there. So it's huge. And I get riding on my bike and I turn around the corner and I'm like heading into like the thick of things. And here comes at me a naked parade. <laughs> And it is 98% men. And, and, and that's a it. lot of penises. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them. I was like, wow, they're all so different. Yeah, so did Mind any, blowing. It was did like, any, I, what? I was going to say, did any stand out? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Some that's piercings. Good. Oh, my God. Some, I think I'm uh, red. Definite variety. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. So you'd be fine. And actually, not only that, but the very first day when I got there, it was like probably seven or eight o'clock at night, just like rolling in. And there was a dude buck naked with a backpack on, like walking around inside of our camp. And I was like, OK, that's how we're doing it here. What? So I was going to ask you about Burning Man at the end, but you brought it up. What is Burning Man? What is it? What does it represent? How did it come um, about? It was like it started about 30 or so years ago, and um, they had, I think, I don't know exactly the history, but it's its like there was, they, they built this sort of like man, essentially, yeah. and they just have a bonfire and burn it, and it just uh -huh. like kind of like, and then it ended up moving locations for more space, and it just became this like cultural um like different reality for a week where people essentially are... It's interesting. It, it seems like there's a it's a place with no rules, but it's in fact the rules that make it so free. And there mm. are ten very very strict rules there, mm. um, but they're all things about like inclusiveness and non judgment and cleaning up after yourself and le like leave no trace and all kinds of all kinds of very like respectful rules. And um, and so uh, people follow the rules very well. And so it's because of those rules that everyone is so free to be themselves. Free free spirit. Okay. Yeah. So back then. Back to NASCAR. Um, when you came to NASCAR, and listen, I'm not going to exaggerate. Uh, the world stopped. It it was like, wow. I mean, the, the view, the ratings. It was it was big. It was it was bigger than big. When you came to NASCAR, did you feel that? Did you feel that all eyes were on you? Um. A little, I think maybe in my nationwide days, it was a little bit just, I remember I was doing so poorly. Like I feel like it was, I finished like 20th and they still wanted to talk to me after the race. And I remember like running away, like, yeah. I don't, like how can you possibly want to talk to me? I just did so poorly. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next week was Phoenix. And I think I had another bad day. And I realized after that one, because it was also like the home GoDaddy race mm -hmm. that I was, I was like, wow, I better like keep my shit together because this is not helping me in any way. And I better clean the, like clear the energy from the weekend before, before the next one so that it just doesn't continue to like spiral in the wrong direction. Um, so I just remember like the fact that I was getting attention for that kind of stuff was like, I, but it, I also thought, well, it's cause I'm new and I'm just starting and they're trying to talk to me about what it's like to now be in NASCAR. But um, but I, I was always so fortunate in my career. I always generally had a lot of attention. So I, it didn't feel like leaps and bounds different, but it was, um, it was more. You, you, you knew what you were doing. You knew how to handle it. You knew how to breathe. I, I get it. I had to um, learn how to breathe. <laughs> yeah. Bit right. More. Right. More. I'm gonna, this is an audible. This means I was not going to ask this question, but listening to you, uh, now, I know you're with Sky Sports right now. You're doing some Formula One. But Denny Hamlin, uh, I've watched you chew his ass out 
which was awesome. It was just good, good for you because you were, you, know, you were standing your ground too. It was just, you know, a guy, two guys fighting, except you were a girl and you're chewing his ass out. So now when you see Denny Hamlin, uh, I know you're not oblivious. Denny Hamlin has said, okay, I like this. I'm a bad guy now. And I like it. I'm going to talk a bunch of crap. And now he's winning more. He just won Bristol. He just won. When he's you really being himself. Okay, go ahead. You're awesome. Take it. Tell me about what you think Danny Hamlin's doing right now. Uh, I think he's a total ass on the track. Like total. Like he's pissed off so many people. Not as many as like Joey Logano, let's say. But um, <laughs> Hold on. Who's worse, Danny or Joey? Yeah. But go, yeah, no, no. good question. They they both have some enemies, but I think Joey has more. Um, but you know, uh, and I had issues with both of them. Um, uh, also, don't like Truex, so I was not too disappointed to see what happened. What did that. what did uh? So I wasn't going to go there. Uh, what did Truex do that pissed you off so bad? You no, know, I just thought he was like. I just end up feeling like on track he was just such a dick when he didn't mm. need to be. He would just like drive way too close when he was lapping me, like, like get me loose. It's just stupid stuff like that, where he just seemed very disrespectful and unnecessarily aggressive. Um, and then I never liked the way that I never liked the relationship with, you know, that, that, uh, that he had, like, I always thought that he just could have done a better job, um, with Sherry. So, you know, I know yeah. I caught a lot of flack for that not long ago, but. Yeah, but you're still a badass. You know, they're, they're, listen, so you can't, so for me, you can't separate the two. Like you can't separate, you know, the person on track from the person off track. You know, they, they're all, they're all you, you know, like for Joey, I actually got along with Joey off track just fine, mm -hmm. but on track, he was just such a pain in the ass. And, and, and so I can't, I can't say, oh, you're a nice guy, but then this is, no, you're not. You're, like you can't yeah. be a dick in one place and expect me to not think you're somewhat of a dick. Right. So. So I back to Danny. You know, no, it, yeah. Well, yeah, but now, now, so these are all the questions I wanted to ask you, but I wanted to show you respect, and now I like you even more. <laughs> because I just I'm say like, it. Because like, also, like, I don't have to, like, I don't see everyone every weekend. You know, I don't yeah. have to worry about, this is my truth. This is my experience. This is also most of my opinions. And everybody's going to have different opinions. You know, I saw... After the race, you know, uh, Kyle Larson, who I love so much and is such a good friend. And he was like, you know, you know, Martin's like probably the most respected guy in the garage. And it's like, OK, that's their experience. I'm not saying that's wrong. You can't say mine's wrong either. Yeah. This is awesome because these are things I wrote down. I went, no, nope, don't write that down. But I know how it feels because when I interview people, I'm like, there's certain things that you like kind of want to ask about, but you don't want to be, you don't want to appear as though you're like setting someone up to be controversial. Right. But, um, but that's, no, it's, it's all right. I'm, I'm going there with you. Can, can any conversation is about a celebration of the person, uh, not yeah. to throw shit at the wall. Yeah. I know. But, but you know, um, that was really a big moment when you, said, I'm not a big fan of Martin Truex, the way he treated Sherry at the end of her life. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you felt, you felt strongly. Tell me bad stories and you want to know what? Everyone texted me and said, you said what we wanted to say. Mm, that's, that's big. That's All I'm going to say, I'm not, I'm going to name a single name in my whole life, but right. what I'm going to say is that plenty of people were like, go, go girl. You got more balls than I do. Right. And you do. Um, are you a tomboy? No. No, you're all girl. Only a tomboy in the sense that I'm super like competitive, aggressive. Um, like the other day I'm playing golf and like I hit a shot out of the sand a hundred yards onto the green. And like, I just like got out of the sand pit and walked and threw the, put the club back in. And they're like, smile. They're like, Tiger Woods would have been happy with that shot. Yeah. And it's just like this disease of discontentment when competing that probably comes off as being a, a masculine or tomboy, but I'm not a tomboy. At, like, no, 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 no. I'm like girly girl like, outside of the car. Like I'm the one that's, you know, like I'll wear like cute pajamas even, you know, yeah. I'll like, match them, you know, or, you know, I'm one of those girls that, you know, like I don't do anything not ladylike in front of guys, you know?
<laughs> this is other awesome. than try and kick their ass, but only for the sake of being successful. Yes, that's why I say when we win, we win. But then all of a sudden, it's oh, I got to win again because that would you know that's only one. Now I got to have two. Yeah, comp Father John, uh, you keep hearing me say that every once in a while. Father John said, Kenny, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be a race car driver. He said, be careful, Kenny. Competition will kill you. And boy, that was early in my life to this day. That still sticks in my head because, uh, you know, I often think about back in the Roman chariot days and how barbaric they were. And, you know, they just chop each other heads off, you know, yeah. to rule the world. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so back to Denny. Uh, ben, De so you're saying right now, Denny playing the bad guy is appropriate. Well, look, like, you know, anybody on the inside, I feel like a lot of people that are going to listen or know the sport pretty well and know the personalities pretty well. And Denny's one of the most seasoned that's been in the series for a long time. And, you know, Denny, Denny can be a, Denny can be a, a handful off track, you know, like, that's been exposed in different situations. Like I'm so happy to see him happy now and engaged to Jordan and the family and everything, but like he hasn't been the most perfect human being. And he, I would think he'd admit that. Mm -hmm. um, and on track, he can, I think he, I think he's more fair than a lot, but, um, but I, and I've always actually had a pretty decent time on track with him other than these moments where it just feels like he, you know, just pushes too hard, you know? and doesn't leave room for error. And, uh, and so I think that, I don't think he's, he's not as bad as some, but he's definitely, I mean, he's aggressive. He's aggressive. I think he waits for his moment a little later. I don't think he's the kind of driver that's like, he's not doing it from the beginning just to do it. I think he, he does wait a little bit. He's a little bit more of the end of the race for a reason kind of guy, but, but he'll, he'll lay a fender. So he's, he's strategic is what you're saying. I think so, yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. totally Debbie down his entire like strategy, but yeah, you know, my very aggressive experience with him at Daytona felt a little out of place, which is why I was so mad Yeah, because uh, he took me out in practice. Like mm. he was so close to me, spun me like on basically on the end of the back straightaway in practice. Yeah, And right. you know, that kind of stuff was totally unnecessary. I, uh, I've had a conversation with Haley Deegan uh, last year. And then about a month ago, I, I talked to Haley's dad, Brian, mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, what an incredible man, you know, uh, he basically created the X games. And he, he said to me, kind of like you did early in this conversation, he says, why did, why do you think Haley's having such a tough time? And I, I never said she was having a tough time. Mm -hmm. I was just marveling at her doing what she's doing. And I immediately answered him with no pause. Hmm. I said, she's a girl. There's a lot of male chauvinists out there. She's been wrecked way more than she's wrecked anybody. Yeah. So with that, I, I want you to comment on what I told Brian. Do you feel like, and listen, I'm talking about you and her. It's collectively. I feel like you were hit in the left. Or like I'd be watching a race. I'm like, oh my God, they just wrecked her. I mean, I mean this happened back in my na nationwide days, like going down the back straightaway at Fontana and the car just, they, this is me. And they just went, turn me yeah. into the wall. So Brian asked a great question, Brian Deegan. He said, it wasn't my place, but I almost went to NASCAR and said, why aren't you doing anything about this? So we would clearly see uh, a guy wreck you or a Haley. And, and there was nothing said about it. I mean, numerous of times did you, Talk I love when that. people comment on me on social media and they're like, oh, all she did was wreck. It's like, well, number one, I actually had the longest streak of running at the finish uh, in IndyCar. His, like, I, I don't remember where it ended up, but it was something like maybe 50 or so um, in a row where I was under my own power at the checkered flag. That was a record. I don't know if it still stands. I have no idea. But like, I didn't crash in IndyCar very often. In NASCAR, I crashed a lot more because I got crashed a lot more. Not See, I agree with I that. I crashed more, but I also was collected in crashes more because there's just a lot more crashing, you know, especially super speedways and stuff like that. Like, And the crashes, because everyone's running closer. In IndyCar, you can't run that close. It's just you can't. And in stock cars, you can. So when one spins, it collects six really easily. So a lot of times there's just nowhere to go. 
Yeah. So, you know, there's generally just a lot more crashing in NASCAR. More than anything, I I, I, I do think people were, I don't think, yeah, I don't think people want to be by, beat by a girl. And you know why? Because I didn't want to get beat by a girl. Yeah. I absolutely know how it feels. Because I didn't see myself that way. So I, I like saw myself as like a winner and like a guy and really competitive and really good. And I didn't want to get beat by a girl. I, so I know. Call me like a hypocrite or chauvinistic or whatever. Like, uh, but I, I didn't want to get beat by a girl. So I know how they feel. Cause you are the girl you're, you're, you know, M Madonna said, I'm a badass bitch. I'm number one. Mm -hmm. And, and I understood cause I grew up in that environment, you know, where look, we're the best. There's nobody better than me. Stop, stop challenging me. So you are Danica Patrick. You are the leader of the pack. Uh, and how dare another girl try to challenge me? Uh, yeah. And I think that I, I don't know why, I guess I, I think he, because no girl was ever really very competitive against me. So yeah. I just had the idea that I was the one, like, it was, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like I, because what you mean? just said is the way all racers think I'm the greatest. Why are you racing me? I knew I was, I know I'm not the greatest. I know that like, that's very, I'm not, I'm honest about that, but yeah. I felt like I was by far the best girl. And so well, you are. And mostly because you I are. just never really raced against them a little bit in go-karting, but I, I, I just always won and always beat them. And so, or it wasn't even close. And so I guess anytime there was a moment where it felt like where someone or a girl was passing me or beating me in a scenario, it just felt like so, uh, it was so rare that it made me think like, holy crap, what's going on? <laughs> Okay. So maybe that's how they feel all the time because I was competitive a lot. Man, you're, you're good at what you do because you've led me right into it. Uh, I want to say this. Okay. Cause I can ask this question a hundred different ways. 100 guys show up at a racetrack and you find one that is the best. Mm -hmm. You can't even get 100 girls. Yeah, this is what I, this, this little, did you, did you, is this your example or do you, are you, are you it's, saying it's, my it's, example? It's your example. Okay, yeah. I, I, I'm taking so your true, word. Right? Okay. So you, you created a firestorm. Uh, stupid. I mean, you're, you're right. They're dumb. Uh, you said it's, uh, you said racing is not normal for the feminine mind. I understood what you said. Yeah. And then. All the Formula One people, in my opinion, yeah, it was F1 people, they attacked you. How how dare she say a woman cannot be a man? Now, listen, my wife, Kim, she doesn't want to be a guy. She doesn't want to race. I, I understood what you said. Yeah. So talk to me about that firestorm. Yeah, I mean, one. thank you. And thanks for defending me. You always, and you defend me a lot. I don't think that you do it just because you're going to defend me no matter what. I think that All you're girls. willing to say it, you know, and I yeah. appreciate that. And I hope that, you know, if I'm ever wrong, feel free to call that out too. Um, but what I meant was that I remember talking to my, I was like with a bunch of girlfriends and I described like aggression and like how I feel even just on the regular road. If a car tries to let, push their way in or do anything on the regular road, like I go into like crazy aggressive, oh, hell no, that's not happening. And I'll, I'll make a spot where there wasn't a spot because they were being a jerk just to like make a point. It's um, my area. And care zero for the fenders of my car whatsoever. Like, and I'm just on the regular road. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, you know, my line is, I'm like, they always lift, you know, like yeah. they don't want to crash. Um, and so this is like all my friends, I was kind of explaining this dynamic and uh, they're like, uh, yeah, we don't think like that. Like, like they're all like, yeah, we no, that's not normal. Like to think in that level of aggression of like stealing that spot or pushing your way in or, you know, whatever that thing is that has to, you have to do to make a point. Um, so it was through that and a couple other scenarios where I was like, it's just like the way my mind works is not a natural way for a woman's mind to work who is normally, normally it's more n n caretaking, neurotic, like careful, like not wanting confrontation, not wanting, um, 
not not wanting to be aggressive and almost even not wanting to be competitive. Like I have some friends that a couple of friends where there's just like not a competitive bone in their body. They don't they don't want to be in that scenario. They don't want to like they do yoga because it's just like non-competitive, you know? And mm -hmm. and so they just they don't even like like competition. And I think competition is such a masculine thing. I think guys love to compete at everything. And generally speaking, and these are all generalities. There's always fringe in everything. But it's more so, so is like I'm a fringe, right? Like yeah. I'm not saying it's not possible. A girl can't think like this and do this. But what's interesting is along the way, every now and again, I'll hear from someone. They're like, have you heard of this girl? I'm like, no. And they're like, she's got that thing. Like she's got that thing like you do. She's like really, you know, it's identifiable Rare. when someone is different and when they're like, they're, they have that level of confidence and aggression that it takes to like really believe that they can do it. Um, and I just think it's less, less of a, less of a female brain and more of a male brain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I agree with that, uh, 100% because, you know, I really, I, I heard about it. I was in the middle of my race season last year. And uh, when I studied into it more, what really drove it home for me is, is you saying, look, the racing world is full of guys. Mm -hmm. And it, take, it takes 100 guys to line up and like, oh, there's, there's Kyle Larson. He's the one. Now there's 99 guys that don't make it. Mm -hmm. And girls, I mean, it's like, oh, my God, there's a girl. Mm -hmm. So you have less chances to find mm -hmm. the one. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I get it. Okay, good stuff. Um, we're coming to the point where I want to highlight everything you're doing right now. Just kind of a quick synopsis. That's a that's a fancy word. Uh, I think, I, yeah. <laughs> Look at me go. <laughs> okay, so um, you are what I call worldly. Uh, you don't say in one spot, you're, you're everywhere all around the world. I mean, I'm excited that I'm going to Italy in January. We're going to seek out all the. That's going to be so racing. Bad. Yeah. I'm jacked up about that. Okay. So I got about five of them and we'll, we'll, we won't be long winded on all of them. Uh, okay. The pretty intense podcast. Um, it, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, you put a lot of effort into it. Mm -hmm. How did that start? Because you're vigilant. You do it. Uh, yeah. You interview the mo the people I've never heard of in my life. Tell me about Pretty Intense Podcast. Um, well, this kind of came about in 2019. I retired in 18, and it was like beginning in 19. And um, podcasts were really, really hitting at that point, just starting to really get rolling. And um, the idea came up for it, and it was like, you just have to ask questions. And I was like, oh, I always have questions. I have so many questions. And so I was like, I can do that. Um, so that was it. That was the start of it. And I just, you know, we just, we had I have quite a variety of people, but it all ends up boiling down to being stuff about like health and wellness. So whether it's about mental health, physical health, spiritual health, um, you know, or knowledge, which is power. It's all about, it's all about that stuff. Yeah. It's good stuff. Um, your winery, Somnium, uh, Danica. You you have your you have a wine, uh, Danica Rose. Yeah, two. Two. Somnium's mine, and Danica Rose is mine. Okay, I didn't know that. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yep. That's awesome, uh, man. My brother Rusty, he will drink some wine, uh, like Chardonnay, just white. He loves it. Tell me about the wine life. It, it, I guess it's got to be relaxing out there. It, it looks is beautiful. I mean, I just fell in love with it. I went to Napa Valley in 2006 and was standing on this top of the prop, a top of this beautiful property, and at 10 a at 10 a.m. with a glass of white wine and just swirling it, thinking, "Man, it would be so cool to have something like this someday." And then, a little over two years later, I bought a property and started the process. So that became Somnium. And um, we finally started selling my 2014 vintage in 2017 because it was a piece of land that was just dirt. So it had to start from mm -hmm. nothing. Um, and then in 2020, I got involved with a, a three other people um, to create a rosé from France, from Provence, where rosé really is like it's like the home of rosé. And um, and so that got going. But the the partners that were involved, it wasn't me who necessarily started that. I kind of got brought in late. And then it ended up being my name 
because it was best for advertising. Anyway, the group kind of like going, they added another wine with somebody else and they, then they started a company with that. And then eight months after that, they went public with it, which meant they weren't selling my wine. So they mm. sold me the company for a dollar. So oh, wow. they yeah. were nice. So, well, they goddamn should have been because, uh, <laughs> I because so. I put in a lot of effort for a couple of years and they didn't do the, what they said they were going to do. So, um, so I took over Danica Rose and it's now in house. And so, um, I'm pretty excited. That's one of those that could like, that could be as big as, as big as anything. Um, yeah. we just have to find the right distribute distributor, um, distribution point And, um, but it's a great wine, but they're all great wines. I find... and, and I started it because I just like drinking it. People always like, why did you start a wine company? I'm like, cause I like drinking it. Yeah. Honest. Uh, I've been out to, uh, you know, obviously we've raced it at Sears Point, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Uh, a lot of different names for racetracks sometimes when sponsors come in. But, you know, gone to Sonoma, uh, you know, and had a dinner in the cave with the one light bulb. Yeah. That that the, the whole wine industry is kind of a vibe, don't you think? Oh, or yeah. It's think? so peaceful and it's like connecting and i feel like it's like getting back to nature a little bit more you're talking about farming you're talking about weather um and it's a very like hands-on intricate process you know there's ways to do it hands off with bulk wine and big 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 block wine situations but for the most part a lot of it's very very hands-on very um it's like it takes a lot of love and a lot of attention um yeah. so um that's the kind of wine i make yeah and I just want to say one more thing about it. I just find it absolutely amazing, intriguing when you see a wine that has been in a barrel for years mm -hmm. and now we're going to drink it. That's, <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's so funny, actually. It is kind of ironic. Oh, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's it's like opening up a time capsule. Yeah. That's the way my, my brain thinks, you know. Um, okay. Let me see. One, two, three. Three more to go here. Uh Sky Sports TV. I see you on the grid for the Formula One races. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about going. What's it like working for uh, TV? Because I did it for 15 years. Ever. Ever. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, Dan, I just want to say this. This is that audible that I talk about. Uh, sometimes doing this is therapy for me, too. The whole time I did TV. Yeah, right. The whole time I did TV, it's like I didn't want to do it because I'm a, there's always this joke in the TV compound. People would say, hey, Kenny, you're really good at TV. I'm like, damn it. I'm a race car driver. I don't want to be good at TV. And that was kind of a devil's curse for me. I ended up quitting just because I hated the commercial airport. I hated being in the hotel room by myself. Long weekends. It's longer weekends when you're doing television than a driver. I hate it. And I, and I literally quit. I mean, just quit making good money. Now I see you doing it. Uh, and I don't expect you to go where I just went. I just wanted to tell you my truth. It was yeah. good for me. Always. Yeah, you're very good at TV. It was always fun to watch you. So what is it like doing Formula One TV, though? I mean, do you got to you gotta walk the line or can you be you? I mean, yeah, I watch I you. I mean, more than anything, at first, I just didn't know that much. Like, I mean, I just... I'm not the kind of driver that like follows everything that's going on, even when I'm in it. Yeah. I don't know every crew chief's name and everything about the car. And, you know, I know about being a driver for sure. And I'm happy to share opinions. That's not something I'm afraid of. Um, but, uh, but so I just really like had to learn the sport. So now I, I actually really enjoy it. I really enjoy watching it even. Um, a little bit of is it to, is to keep up with it, of course, because um, starting in May will be Miami and then I'm doing seven races again this year. So um, I need to be up on everything. But I also find it really nice because there's only like 20 cars and yeah, you right. Kind of get a you can kind of get the gist of like everybody's race. But, you know, in NASCAR, it's like, you know, you had a tough job to keep track of not just like 40 cars in one series, but keeping track of what everybody's doing everywhere. And there's just so many things going on. So, um, I feel like, uh, I feel like it's, um, it's fun, but it is way, it is way more work, way more time consuming because yeah. the drivers are there. You're there surrounding everything the driver's doing. So the driver just shows up for this practice, the qualifying, the race, and 
I mean, they have a little bit more to do than that, of course, but, but for television, you're there like hours before they're on track and you're there for a couple of hours off after track, after they're off track. And so, and then, you know, you're not the like sleeping arrangements. Isn't the same as just like go to your bus in the compound in F1, you're going to a hotel. So you get on the team bus and it might take an hour in traffic to get back to the hotel. And, you know, you get back on the bus at eight o'clock in the morning the next day to do it again. So it's, um, they're really long days, but, um, but I do like them. It is fun. It is interesting. And, um, and I'm like, I like it more all the time because I'm, I'm, I feel like I really know what's going on now. I created a firestorm about two weeks ago and, and I want you to help me because, yeah. uh, I said, Max Verstappen, he comes by me, mm -hmm. and about 10 seconds later, another car comes by, and then about four seconds later, another car comes by, and at Surfer's Paradise, it was <laughs> packed, standing room only. Every time a Formula One car came by, every, ah. so are we talking about the race in Australia that they just had? Yeah. Okay. Okay, but okay, so what I'm saying is in Formula One, they don't race very much there's not a lot of battling in my mind mm -hmm. okay now over here's nascar they're beating the hell out of each other yeah. they're side by side yeah but but formula one is way more exciting in this world view what 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 do i got wrong what what don't i know um i mean i think that a little bit of it is um it's very glamorous you know, you drive for Ferrari, you know, like, I think there's some glamour element to it. Um, I think that it's, I think there's something to be said about the races being over with in under two hours. Mm. I think that, I think it's easy to keep, like, I can sit down and watch the whole race and not feel like I just lost half the day. Right. You know, yeah, I think I like personally that. NASCAR races are way too long. And like I can, I can understand if there's some that are long, but like, man, it's so hard to sit there for four or five hours and want, like, you, you know, there's pre-race and man, it's like, but you're there for three to four hours for sure for the race. And it's like, that's a lot of commitment and a lot of attention span. So I think there's some benefit in it being shorter races. Um, and they're almost a little like, I know they have, you know, their sprint races, but even the races are almost like sprint races when they're trying to decide like, you know, one, two stops, maybe, you know, how are they going to, strategize it. It's like, you're going so hard. The it's not, it's not even common to have cautions in F1. So there's also a lot of, um, explanation of strategy of where the cars are going to end up bases, like based on like undercut overcut. Um, so it's, I think they kind of cram it all into, uh, to it. I think the cars are sexy. They sound good. Um, they, uh, you know, they look cool running, you know, they look good on track. They, um, yeah, I think I think glamour, I think shorter races. I think I also think there's some good personalities. You know, I think they're in a really good phase with their drivers, driver lineup in, in Formula One. And we see this in all all sports. Um, sometimes there's just a wave of personalities in a sport that lift it up. Yeah. And I think F1's in that phase right now. I think Drive to Survive played a big role. Um, and not only understanding more about racing, but also understanding more about the drivers and, and cho choosing someone to cheer for. Um, I mean, shoot, there was people like people cheer for like team principals now, right? Like they, yeah. you know, right? like, do they do that? They don't really do that in, in any other racing, I feel like, cause you don't really know them that well. So, um, so I think there's quite a few reasons why it's popular. Um, and it's global, you know, it's a lot of different, a lot of different people with their eyes on it. I really am intrigued by it and I really want to go. Uh, if I am to go to a Formula One race uh, and I don't care how difficult it is to get there, do you have any idea? Which, which one? What, what is the one that everybody brags on? What is the one I should go to? Have you heard? Um, I can only speak to the ones that I've been to. Um, but the one I would say that sticks out the most that I think would be cool. I mean, Singapore is pretty cool. I mm. like that was a fun one last year. Um, and then I think Austin's a great one. I mean, you can go around and see a lot of the track. Um, the racing can be pretty good there. Um, great turn one. Um, you know, you're Texas. So, you know, town's a little ways away, but it's, uh, you know, great food. So it's like a great, it's a great weekend. 
Um, so I think Texas is a pretty good one too, Austin. Yeah. So I, I, again, I can only speak. I'm this year. I'm adding on uh, Barcelona and Abu Dhabi at the end of the year. So I'm going to do- Abu Dhabi. Man, they got some good lighting there. That baby's yeah. lit. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. This is the end. We got one more question, and no better way to end it with my favorite subject that we're going to talk very minimal about. <laughs> but I'm going there. Cheese. You went on the Tucker Carlson show. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you said, you said, I'm going to quote you. You said, and just like that, I'm into politics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I love politics, but it's, it's, uh, it's taboo for me now because it drove me absolutely insane. I would go to sleep at night. I couldn't sleep. So Kenny and myself had a look in the mirror and I, I'm not out of it. I just don't comment on it anymore. I'm excited you were talking about it. But what was it like to go on the Tucker Carlson show? You went on there. That was awesome. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, it hasn't come out. Um, but I went at the very beginning of the year. I went with my sister to a turning point event called AmFest in Phoenix. And mm. that was in December. And um, I posted about it. Yeah, And it, of course, looked like a mega Trump rally because it's all red, white and blue. And, you know, like it, that's just what it looks like. So everybody just kind of seemed to think I was losing my mind or some kind of radical. And it's like, when did saying I love my country become radical? And so uh, so it kind of fired me up. And I feel like, uh, you know, so that's AmFest. And Tucker was was um, one of the guys that spoke at AmFest. And so. I've been connected with him uh, and I was supposed to do his show back when he was still at Fox and then it was scheduled last year and then something came up. I was supposed to do it maybe in Maine where he has a house that didn't work out. It got ended up getting canceled. So when I met him and his people, it was like, oh, you know, he was he was even better in person, like he's even better in person. And uh, so after that, the team was like, oh, my God, that was so great. We've got to get you on the show. And I said, this, you know, sooner the better, like as the year goes on, I get more busy. And um, so this was that like late December. And then I was doing the show January 3rd. So I flew out on the second and did his show on the third. So um, so it was a quick turnaround. And they're like, oh, we love you. We got to get him on your show, too. So um, so I've got that somewhere in my back pocket at some point in time, hopefully. Um, but he was just great. Like he's just he's just great. And he's a he has this like childlike wonderment in interviews, you know, it's like, he's like, got this, like, really, you know, like, yeah. really like, <laughs> like, <Scooby-Doo. laughs> yeah, like he gets really into it. You know, he's like surprised and he has like this genuine, like, you know, refreshing sort of, you know, there's no like, Oh, I knew that or jadedness or judgment. It's just kind of like curiosity. It's like this wonderment of a human. And, um, and I think that's what makes him a great interview. And he also really does a good job of continuing to ask questions to understand. He'll be like, oh, I don't get it. What do you mean? You know, and he really makes you kind of peel away until he gets it, which is probably pretty good for everybody else getting it, too. So. Uh, so, yeah. So he's 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 a really cool guy. I felt very cool when I got his cell phone number. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, uh, no. that Yeah. Well, I like him a lot. Uh, so I had to back out of it because I was going crazy. Because I, anyway, I won't go there. But but I got to say this. When I was on social media about politics, uh, it was a war. And and I would engage in it because sometimes I like to fight. Uh, and I think everybody does. But Daryl Waltrip said something to me I'll never forget. Because, he, he, you know, he's a little older than me. He's a little wiser. He says, um, when you get into politics, you know, you're going to lose half your friends. Um, what do you think about him saying Maybe that? Half my followers too. You never know. I definitely, when I post about po- politics stuff, it you see some drop in that, but yeah, then you get well, some back because you know, that's how it works. Yeah. And, and, so and, I, I'd say the same thing works with friends. Good, good point. You know, right? you won't drop some friends, but you're going to pick some up too, because you're going to find more of your people and yeah. those are going to be, it's going to make you happier anyway. And And that goes back to the start of our, talk about an hour ago yeah. i want to be surrounded with people that lift me up make me happy mm-hmm. so yeah danica listen um i gotta tell everybody this right now we are in podcast form too uh so you can listen to danica on the way to work 
and this is a long one, and on your way back home, and then on your way back to work, and then on your way back home, we are the Kenny Wallace Show. We're on iTunes. We're on Spotify. And uh, Danica Patrick, thank you so much. I really I'm appreciate excited it. excited for this, Kenny. I love you so much. You're the best. I I think that your your spirit is one of those needed spirits in the world. You damn right. Damn right. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, a lot of people uh, that I admire, my family grabbed my phone behind my back, went to Danica Patrick, Rick Flair, Jeff Gordon, and you wished me a happy birthday. And it was on my video, my birthday video. I turned 60 last year. So I see you now. Thank you for my uh, birthday video. Uh, that, that was pretty cool. Well, Danica, all right, everybody, listen. Uh, we got more in the pipeline. Kyle Bush is coming up next. Until next time, uh, the Kenny Wallace, Kenny conversation just keeps on rolling. Uh, thank you all very much, and see you later, Danica. Bye, Kenny.